and I think that's great. So, you know, but that first moment is definitely an eye-popping moment that, that opens up new worlds. Red Mage talked about JSTOR, and more, I guess, more broadly, talked about the, the amount of information that was widely available. And this one is a great thing for me, too. I love, the, first of all, the, the JSTOR specifically, talking about Red Mage, couldn't agree more. Fantastic answer. Think of the first time you had to, you went to an online academic journal or an online series of academic journals like JSTOR is because it's just a series of on, online academic journals and an assemblage of other things like book chapters and things like that. At least it was last time I used it. You go and you type in something and all of a sudden, bam, you have all of this different information and these different sources that were available for you that if you went to go search in a, in a catalog for books or things like that, you might find a book, you had to go and get the book, and then you'd start you know, opening the book and reading the book to see if it actually had anything that, that you might be able to use. That's wonderful, but at the end of the day, and so much better than I guess anything could have happened before the Dewey Decimal System where people had to kind of organize their own libraries, but the point is the idea of that kind of information being available online is amazing. Now, I'm going to take this into another direction. Several of you talked about the idea of the Internet being available so that you could kind of, it would, you know, just allowed you to open, open your minds because there were so many great pieces of information out there. I think that goes along the lines with a lot of the rhetoric that surrounded the Internet when it first became pub very widely available. Was that, man, this is going to, this is going to be the, va the great vanquisher of ignorance. We're all going to be so much smarter because of the Internet, and information is going to be so much more highly available that no one will be able to defend, you know, opinions that are, um, that are small-minded or that, are, that don't take all the information into account. I'm going to fundamentally disagree with that point, and I think if there's anything the Internet has showed us, it's that, it's, it's that it does a great job at propagating ideas. But what I will tell you, and what you don't have to go very far to find, is that the what we've learned over the course of the last 20 years is that the internet is just as good at spreading incorrect ideas as it is spreading correct ideas. It's just as good at propagating rumor and speculation as it is fact. It's just as good at, at propagating ideas that are problematic for society as those that probably help most of us in the long run. I'm not going to pretend that I am the one that draws the lines as to what any of those things mean. What I will tell you is that I think the internet has become kind of a dumpster for all those things. And what, and, and what ends up happening is that it propagates a lot of very problematic things just as much. In other words, folks, the internet becomes a reflection of humanity and not a reflection of this new media uh, medium at all. So, while Red Mage talks about a great, great use of how the, the internet is, is a great way to access information that, that uh, we never had access to before, point taken, I will also challenge several of you that went on to say, well, this was a great tool. I, I don't, I, I'm not so sure about that. And it, it, that is not the eye-opening experience I think many of us were looking for when we started using the internet. We all thought it was going to cure cancer and, and do all these other great things, which it has not done. But what it certainly has done is allow you to find more freely available pictures of Kim Kardashian anytime you'd like to, any day of the week. Uh, sure, go for it. So if, if that's value to any of you, then fantastic. To me, not so much. All right, the Beer Ninja talked about something I think all of us can identify with, and that is the Alta Vista search. And maybe your search engine of choice was not Alta Vista, although it certainly was mine. But the, uh, I remember the first time I was in a, a, an English class, um, I, I probably shouldn't even tell you this because this probably could be one of my answers, but I was in an English class. I was a sophomore in college and it was the first time I had ever heard a small word that would fundamentally change the way that I and everyone else would, would inevitably live and that is Google. The first time I ever heard this word, a teacher asked us to go home and you know, find some sources of, of, of what we were talking about at the time not necessarily to cite academically, but just to go out and find some people that had stories about certain things. Um, at the time, I think it was domestic abuse, things like this. We were talking, we were going to write about it, and we wanted to kind of get a couple sources about it. And what she did was she told us to go home and put it into Google, because this Google was this new cool thing that you could use, and at that time it had only been around probably, it would be under three years at that point. So it was still fairly new. Not a, it was not the most widely available search engine. But I remember the first time I used it, it became it, it destroyed everything else. I was using AltaVista. I was using you know Dogpile, um, Lycos, 
uh, Yahoo. I was using all of those for, for a long time, but uh, Google obviously changed that. But that first time, I, 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 like, I had to think about this. I thought about this long and hard. I don't know if any of you guys have. What was the first time you used a search engine? What'd you search for? You know, I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like, that's that's the kind of thing I was hoping uh, you guys would think about this week. You know, the beer ninja that remembers his first Alta Vista search, and I think many of us, if we could look back at the first search we ever ran online, we'd probably have a very good laugh. Uh, and if we could see an amalgamation of all of the searches we have levied over the years, what we would probably find is nothing but hilarious um, nuance as to what we, uh, what, how our lives have changed and what Google realizes that the stuff that we search for probably is a good reflection of who we are, what we like, and what we want to buy, and uh, the kind of things we're interested in. And thusly is born the internet that we all know today. Love it or hate it. Muscular Thumbs talked about something that is near and dear to my own heart. Several of you, including I remember Mays, mentioned this was the idea of Napster being widely available. Why is Napster important, you say? Well, Napster is not necessarily the first um, attempt at, at something very fundamental to the Internet, which is not only P2P, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, but also the, the, the idea of being able to, to centrally host um, a very, very extensive database or a very, very extensive network, let's say, of people that have stuff. And if people want stuff, they just go to this place, they type in a search, it queries this, this particular database and comes back with, hey, these people have the stuff that you want, and then you go and get it, right? The, in other words, folks, the essence of the P2P network. Napster didn't host anything themselves. They certainly were not, uh, they certainly did not, you know, have any file servers of their own that uh, maintain any of this content, this stuff, but they connected you to people who did very, very easily. What that did was it made a lot of stuff, most importantly online music, a hell of a lot easier to find. Because back in those days, folks, you know, there were no iTunes releases, remember, the only way that MP3s existed, or any audio files for that example, I remember very large WAV files, for example, was if you actually ripped the CDs that you had, or if you were given the MP3s or the files otherwise of the CDs that your friends or friends of friends had ripped. That was the only way to get digital music back then. And by the way, a lot of them were not very good quality because the ripping programs back then were not very good and had a lot of really terrible, you know, uh, compression ratios and and. You could always tell when someone was playing MP3s in the car because the audio quality was so awful and there were blips and things and it was just terrible. In any case, Napster opens the, the door for all of us to be thinking about all that stuff. Really, really cool. I remember being connected the first time I, I ran a Napster search. That was a great thing as well. And um, I, that would definitely be one of my, my memories. Uh, one of the very first courses I took in college was a rock and roll history course. And Napster was obviously the forefront of the conversation there, and I'm telling you right now, it was, it was hot stuff, because everyone had an opinion about how Napster was going to change the face of music, and it indeed did do that. So I think that was a great one. And lastly, I'm going to talk about Grateful Dead, which talked about the idea of Facebook. So Facebook was the moment that changed everything for you on the Internet. I think that's a good one. Um, for, for many of us that predate Facebook by a long shot on the Internet, uh, you know, probably not as much, but I think for many of our audience uh, members out there um, as a part of the community, you really did grow up with Facebook. And for that, I think your life has been fundamentally different. Maybe you don't use Facebook now as your central way of contacting people, but when I jumped on, the, the only thing I really found Facebook to be incredibly powerful tool in, in, in achieving um, any kind of activity in the Internet was being able to keep up with people that you went to school with or that you knew from your childhood. Because... It basically, Facebook, in my estimation, really outmoded the high school reunion. At that point, there was really no reason to have a high school reunion because Facebook was kind of an instant high school reunion. And as a matter of fact, my parent, my dad, and um, and and even myself now, you know, I've found it's it's like it's a primary way that I connect with people that I went to high school with. Um, well, except for Rue, of course, who I, I, uh, I whether you you know I think that's a great thing or a terrible thing, I communicate with fairly regularly. In any case, 
Um, you know, Facebook certainly did change the way that we contact with pe contact people and connect with people. But what I'll say is this: the first time that I went on Facebook and I typed in, "Hey, this is who I am, and this is where I went to school," and all of a sudden it goes, "Bam!" You probably know these people. And all of a sudden, I looked down there, and lo and behold, I did. I knew every single one of them. And I went, "Oh boy, th this is changing everything." Right? That did. That was a great moment, and a moment where I said, "This is going to change everything." I wasn't necessarily thinking of why it knew that or if it was problematic that it knew that, which is a different story for a different time, but I definitely knew at that point that, uh, that the whole world had changed. All right, so now it comes into my own, uh, my own two cents, as it were, uh, in regard to this particular story. I, um, I had a couple moments that changed my life in terms of thinking the Internet was going to change the world. First was in middle school. I did a. I was in a um, a club. I don't know. It was necessarily a club. It was more like a kind of an academically. I, I guess we'll call it academically gifted thing. It was only a part of like a, a couple science classes. We did a thing called science by mail, and what it did was basically you would kind of get to place out of the regular science course, and you would instead spend time independently. Um, you know, working with a couple people to do remote correspondence with a, a scientist in the field and you would kind of work back and forth on doing experiments and, and these kinds of things that were given to you. Um, and it was actually pretty neat. Um, the only problem was when they say science by mail, they mean science by mail. It was supposed to be by snail mail. You'd run an experiment, you'd kind of get some results, you'd send it to them, they'd send it back to you, blah, 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 blah. But they had one little option down at the end of the page which was if you have this new wonderful thing called email, if you have access to that, then by all means use email to connect to your person. That way you can actually send them the stuff that way rather than doing it over uh, snail mail. So I remember I went to a terminal that my dad had at home and it had no intelligence. That's why I can tell you that. It was a dumb terminal. It had a 9600 baud modem and I could connect to the back end of where my dad worked and only use one little email address to contact. And it was text only on a, on a green and black screen. So it was a monochrome green screen and type in emails. All right. So what this did was it completely changed everything for me. I was able to email this person. No one else in my group had email at the time. And he emails me back. And the first time I get an email back from this, from this scientist in the field who had, um, who had actually volunteered for it, um, it was actually one of the most amazing moments ever. It was like, here I am talking to this person I had never, ever anticipated, never would have talked to otherwise, and he's helping me with my schoolwork. How incredible is this, right? I, I just knew things would change at that point. So you could talk about that being email, you could talk about that being, you know, the connection of the people, but in one way or another, that definitely opened my eyes. The second thing I'll talk to you about is something that is near and dear to us at the Clan of the Grey Wolf because it involves both myself and Rue when we were in, I want to say it was the last year of middle school, so eighth grade and also the first year of high school, but mostly probably the first year of high school. I got AOL at, at my house. Rue already had AOL at his, but Rue was connecting on a machine that would be at best described as an ancient machine. Um, it was, as I recall, a 386. It could have been a 486. I'm not 100% sure. It might have been a 486. But in any case, it was a, it was a 386 that, that had a modem, I believe, that was somewhere in the lines of 3600 baud. Um, it was it was absolutely it took 10 minutes from the time that you push the button to sign on to when you actually were connected and then every time you click the button it would take five minutes to load a page. So and we called this connection. This was good, right? This was fun. This was great. So, you know, we, we would go and connect, and when, you know, lo and behold, to go to my house, the first, connect, the first PC I ever connected to the Internet with, I think, was at the very, was at least a 486, but was probably an x86 platform once they moved forward into like a Pentium 2 or something like that. I think it was a Pentium 2. But anyway, it was a Pentium 2 laptop. I also had a Mac that I connected to the Internet, and the speeds that I could connect were much, much faster. I think there was an 18.8 modem, oh, not an 18.8, a 14.4 modem that I connected with the, um, 
uh, with the Mac, and then there was a 19, uh, was it 19? 19K? I don't remember all the iterations in between that I connected with the um, with the laptop, and it changed everything.